Hello, welcome to West Virginia University College of Law. I'm the Dean at the College of Law. I'm Joyce McConnell, and I want to make sure to reach out to all of you and welcome you personally. We're so delighted to have you here and absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to participate in the university-wide Darwin Fest. Before I begin my comments on the speaker series of which um, Professor Wexler is, is a part, I want to take a moment to say that a dean is very fortunate indeed when she has a fabulous faculty and donors who are willing to uh, create endowments that allow us to bring professors like Professor Wexler to the university. And I particularly want to um, thank Professor Anne LaFasso, who has taken the lead on organizing today's event and Professor John Taylor, who has assisted her, although he always tells me it's really Anne and not John. What's really important for all of you to know is that these two members of our faculty are really extraordinary, and we wouldn't have this day without them. So thank you very much. Of course, there's always the risk of mentioning certain folks, right, because then you leave out others. Um, so if I've left you out, I'm sorry, uh, but you're wonderful too. Um, the, um, the, today what we're, we're celebrating is Darwin, and we have the opportunity to hear from Professor Wexler because of the generosity of the Donnelly family. This lecture series was endowed uh, in memory of Edward G. Donnelly, it's conducted, these lectures are conducted annually under the direction of our faculty. The purpose of these lectures is to bring to the university distinguished members of the legal profession and of legal education to lecture in a field of current interest and development in law. Over the years, the Donnelly Memorial Lectures have made substantial and significant contributions to the growth of legal knowledge and have illuminated the directions the law must take in fulfilling its function in society. These lectures, as I said, are made uh, possible through the income from a trust administered by the WVU Foundation, and they were created in memory of Mr. Edward G. Donnelly by his widow and his son, both of whom are now deceased. Edward Donnelly had a distinguished career as a lawyer who engaged in active practice of law in Morgantown, West Virginia, from the date of his graduation in 1899 to his death in 1952. His life and career were marked by his outstanding contributions to the law, to church, to civic and financial affairs of the community, and particularly the welfare and growth of the WVU College of Law. It's therefore a fitting memorial to Edward Donnelly that these lectures continue to provide us the opportunity to think about law in a deeper way and to understand its significance in law and also in our culture. Thank you very much, and um, I am so delighted you're here, and now P Professor John Taylor will deliver opening remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you all here. Welcome to the College of Law and to Darwin Fest. Uh, the philosopher Dan Dennett has said that Darwin's idea that life evolves through natural selection was the best idea that anyone has ever had. 
Think about that. Some competitors are up there, perhaps. Power flows from the consent of the governed. It's pretty good. Tastes great, less filling, also a popular choice. <laughs> to my knowledge, no one has yet said that Jay Wexler's ideas are the best that anyone has ever had. But it is, I think, only a matter of time before this happens. <laughs> I have long admired Professor Wexler's writing about the First Amendment issues concerning uh, the teaching of evolution in the public schools. In a series of very thoughtful articles, he staked out the interesting, plausible, and I think ultimately correct position that schools ought to do more than they are now doing to, quote, teach the controversy about evolution in the public schools. But Professor Wexler, Wexler maintains they ought to do this not in the biology classroom, but in the social science classroom. Jay has that for collapsing your carefully nuanced views into a sound body. Um, you can read all about Professor Wexler's many accomplishments in the program. I've gotten to hang out with him some the last couple of days, and I'll say he's also a really cool guy for what that's worth. I will mention that his forthcoming book uh, that we'll hear this spring is called Holy Hullabaloo's, A Road Trip to the Battlegrounds of the Church-State Wars. Uh, the book has won advanced praise from superstar Stanford Law Professor Pam Carlin, one of the smartest people on the planet. Uh, she said, think Sarah Val's assassination vacation meets Peter Irons' Courage of Their Convictions. An intriguing description, I'm sure you'll agree. It'll be available soon at a bookstore near you. Today, the title of Professor Wexler's talk is Two Errors About the Evolution Controversy or what I learned from my trip to the Creation Museum. Won't you please join me in welcoming Jay Wexler. Well, hello. Hello and welcome. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here to uh, speak at the Darwin Fest. I've never really spoken at any sort of uh, fest before. So I'm pretty excited. I, I certainly want to say the word Darwin Fest as many times as I can. Darwin Fest. And in any event, uh, I'd like to extend my warm thanks to Anne Lafazzo and John Taylor and everyone else here at the university and the law school for inviting me to speak at the Darwin Fest and for being just absolutely incredible hosts. Uh, I've had a terrific time already and I look forward now to talking to you about the constitutional controversy over teaching evolution and intelligent design. So I've been writing and teaching uh, about church-state issues for about a dozen years now, and I, I think it's just really the most fascinating area of law I've ever encountered, which is why I've stuck with it uh, all this time, despite my sort of inherent need to look around and, and, and think about and do new things. It's full of all sorts of great issues, from school prayer to school funding of, to protecting the free exercise of religion, which is something that I feel very strongly about. And, but while all the issues are compelling, the one that has always gripped me the most is this controversy over teaching evolution in the public schools. Now, one thing I like to do from time to time is to read the comment threads connected to news articles about the topic to see what people are thinking. I find that reading these comment threads uh, not only helps me keep up to date, but it also reminds me of the calm and relaxed nature of the discourse that we Americans enjoy when talking about our most contentious issues involving religion. So, for example, after the Florida Board of Education decided in February of 2008 to require for the first time that schools teach the scientific theory of evolution, readers of the Orlando Sentinel contributed these words of wisdom to the paper's website. And I'm just going to read a few, and they come from different sides of the debate. Here's one. Well, one more battle won by the devil. The atheists and agnostics are taking over the world, and no one seems to care, but God will win in the end. America will continue to throw God out until such a time comes that people will be begging God for mercy and he will not be there for him, for them. Judgment is coming to America. Second quote. Why don't we give equal credit to the theory of intelligent descent, which has supporting evidence in the Bible verses about Jesus walking on water? I mean, come on, gravity is only a theory too, right? Religious nutcases will be the downfall of the nation. Look what happened to the Asian subcontinent. Third quote. Wake up, people. This is the 21st century. Put your silly myths away, or at least keep them to yourselves and your churches and your homes. Don't try foisting this crap on the rest of us. Two more. This is the fourth. I personally love the idea that all of humanity came from two people who sprouted out of the ground like a couple of tomatoes that encouraged their descendants to engage in incest to produce the six billion people that are on the planet today. That's classic. And, f and finally... 
okay, dot, dot, now, dot, 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 so now can all you religious zombies back off? The controversy over evolution, as you can see, does not bring out the best in people. There are many, many, many examples, some of which are far more serious than saying a few mean things on a website. One of the worst comes from Texas, where in 2007, the science curriculum director of the state's education agency was basically forced to resign for circulating a brief FYI email announcing an upcoming talk by an opponent of intelligent design. But overreaction is by no means the sole property of evolution opponents. Scientists, too, can be completely hard-headed and unreasonable. A few years ago, I was invited by a student group at Harvard Law School to debate the constitutionality of teaching intelligent design with a professor from Baylor University who had called my arguments in print to be patently unreasonable, philosophically irrelevant, and wide of the mark. Can you imagine that? I accepted the invitation and I did the debate. And it turned out that although I disagreed with the guy's positions, we got along great. And although I totally crushed him in the debate, um, <laughs> Our discussion was, in fact, quite civil. Not so the question and answer period. The first person to uh, ask, I guess you could say, a question identified himself as an MIT scientist named Steve. And then he spent 15 minutes badgering my opponent with accusations and ad hominem attacks. The room was filled with people, much like today, who wanted to ask questions, but the guy wouldn't stop talking despite my opponent's gracious responses, and even long after it was clear to everyone in the room that things had gotten out of hand. For defenders of evolution like myself, the episode was completely embarrassing. As an observer named Steve put it on a blog the next day, quote, I attended the debate. Although I am completely opposed to creationism and ID, I found your questions, comments, and general demeanor to be rude, irritating, and off point. You so attempted to monopolize the limited question and answer session, it seemed you were a step away from being asked to leave. If you are the best, side, best our side can muster, then I fear that ID will be soon be taught in schools across the country. At the least, you are an embarrassment to Steve's everywhere. <laughs> I've always thought that if we're going to make any progress on this issue at all, everyone needs to settle down. Both sides have valid claims. Scientists are right that evolution should be taught in biology classes and that alternatives to evolution which have enjoyed no success or little success in scientific journals should not be and cannot be under the First Amendment. But some critics of evolution do reasonably argue that the typical public school curriculum wrongly ignores religion. How can schools claim to turn out educated citizens if they teach their students nothing about religion? In my talk today, I'll try to explain why a curricular compromise is needed. I will suggest that schools should continue to teach evolution and only evolution in biology classes, but that they should also start teaching students more about religion. And I'll also point out what I think are the two most prevalent mistakes that people make when they think about this controversy. And while I'm doing that, I will also tell you about the trip that I took a couple of years ago to the Creation Museum on the outskirts of Cincinnati. In the United States, we have been battling over evolution in the courts for, over, for uh, nearly 100 years. Everybody has heard of the infamous Scopes trial, which took place in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. Tennessee had a law prohibiting teachers from talking about evolution. And Scopes agreed to be a guinea pig in a case organized by the ACLU to challenge the law. And what I love most about the trial was that part of it was held outside on the courthouse lawn. And I think it would be kind of great if we did that more often. And the state could sell, they could sell tickets and then use the money to hire competent defense lawyers for defendants facing the death penalty. But anyways, Scopes lost. In fact, it took the jury something like nine minutes to convict him. And most of that time was spent getting to and from the jury room. It wasn't until the play Inherit the Wind came around 30 years later, with its depiction of the William Jennings Bryan character as a buffoon, that the case started being seen as a big victory for science over religion, which it never really was. Apart from Scopes, the courts have been incredibly friendly to evolution. Two Supreme Court cases have struck down state laws trying to undermine it. In the 60s, the court struck down a Scopes-like law from Arkansas, and in the 80s, the court struck down a Louisiana law that said that if a school teaches evolution, it has to give equal time to creation science. Now, in both cases, the court said that the laws were completely motivated by religion, although I'm sure that if they had explicitly considered the question, the majority of the justices would have said that the programs also endorsed religion in violation of the First Amendment. 
Now, foes of evolution think that these cases are very irritating, but they certainly have not stopped trying to find a way around them. And one of the most recent strategies, of course, has been to promote intelligent design, a purportedly scientific theory that allegedly proves that an intelligent designer created the world. Supporters of, quote, ID never say that the intelligent designer they have in mind is God, or at least never publicly say that. Sometimes they say that aliens from another planet might have created the world, or that human beings, for example, traveled back in time to do it. But basically, the idea behind ID is that there are scientific methods for distinguishing between things that happen randomly and things that are designed by some intelligent being. And it's possible, ideas uh, say, to use these methods for determining, for example, whether a watch that you find on the beach was created by an intelligent being or just came about randomly. And if you can do this for a watch or a structure happened upon during an archaeological dig, or a suspicious scene happened upon during a crime investigation, then you can surely do the same thing for the origins of the universe. Now, proponents of ID spent a good decade developing a well-organized strategy to get their theory into the public school science classrooms as an alternative to evolution. Their work paid off when a school district in central Pennsylvania implemented, over the objection of science teachers, a policy to introduce ID and to refer them to an ID textbook in the library for more information. I think it took exactly 14 seconds after the policy went to, into effect for the ACLU to sue. The case was assigned to Judge John Jones, an appointee of George W. Bush, and Judge Jones held a trial that lasted over a month. The trial involved all sorts of testimony about blood clotting and bacterial flagella and the scientific method and how one of the school board members had said 2,000 years ago someone died on a cross, can't someone stand up for him now? Uh, and at the end of the trial, evolution supporters were pretty sure they were going to win, but they had no idea exactly how far the judge was going to go. As it turned out, Judge Jones completely obliterated ID. It was like he took ID outside, put it on a smooth stone, put on a pair of Doc Martens, put on Metallica's Black Album, and then jumped up and down on ID with both feet for two hours while screaming. In an opinion that went on for 139 pages and weighed in slightly under uh, the weight of a small rhinoceros, the judge found the school's policy unconstitutional for at least three or four different reasons. He said that the policy endorsed religion and was motivated by a religious purpose. He said that ID is not science. He said that defendants had lied, and he described the school's policy as, quote, breathtaking inanity. The decision was more than any evolution uh, supporter could have hoped for or expected. And although the decision was not appealed, because by the time it came down, the original school board had been replaced by a pro-evolution board, and only officially applies in a small area in central Pennsylvania, most people nonetheless think that the decision effectively sounded the death knell for intelligent design in the public schools. Now, the bottom line of Judge Jones's opinion is right. Teaching ID in the public schools violates the First Amendment. In my view, the reason for this is that it endorses religion. It's a complicated argument that I've written about in academic journals a lot, but the basic point is something like this. Because opposition to evolution has historically always been inextricably linked to religion, and because credible scientists reject ID overwhelmingly, and because ID theorists have failed to get their papers published in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and because the idea that the world was designed by a single creator is essentially a religious belief, any decision to teach ID in the science classroom sends the message that the science curriculum is determined by religion. To me, this suggests that any reasonable person viewing a school district's adoption of an ID policy under current conditions would conclude that the school has endorsed religion. Now, therefore, I agree with Judge Jones that the Pennsylvania policy endorsed religion. And I also agree under the circum specific circumstances of this particular case, uh, the school board's purpose was religious. The one thing I don't agree with the judge's finding, uh, with the, the, the one thing I don't agree with is the judge's finding that ID is not science. It's not that I think ID is science. I think it's probably bad science. I don't really know. Because since I'm not a philosopher of science, I have no idea what distinguishes science from non-science. I know that philosophers of science have long argued about what is and is not science, and that some of them think it's pretty fruitless to even try to distinguish science from non-science. So I'd be pretty surprised if a lawyer, without training in the philosophy of science, sitting behind a bench in the middle of Pennsylvania, would suddenly be able to come up with a definitive answer on the question. I think the judge should have just left the science, non-science question alone. It doesn't actually matter at all to the constitutional question whether ID counts as science in some technical or philosophical sense. 
The Constitution, after all, does not prohibit schools from teaching non-science or bad science in science classes. It simply forbids schools from endorsing religion. Since it's fairly clear that teaching ID endorses religion, even if it happens to be scientific in some sense, there was no need for the judge to decide whether ID is or is not science. In fact, I think this whole, quote, is it science question is actually dangerous for supporters of evolution. What would happen if another judge hearing an ID case were to read some philosophy of science and decide that what distinguishes science from non-science is whether a theory is, say, falsifiable? One of the factors that philosophers of science have always mentioned as being perhaps a key characteristic of science. Since opponents of ID like to argue that lots of things about the world appear not to be intelligently designed, like the human appendix, for example, uh, and that therefore ID is false, might ideas credibly claim that ID is in fact falsifiable? Would that make ID science? Would teaching ID then become constitutional? Who knows? A lot of the confusion about the teaching evolution issue stems from two fundamental misconceptions that many people share, one of which is generally held by evolution supporters, and the other of which is embraced by evolution opponents. I think it's very important to highlight these mistakes, and that's why I've chosen to title my talk the way I have, Two Mistakes About the Evolution Controversy. So what I'd like to do is to first take the one held by evolution opponents. More times than I can count, I have heard something resembling the following argument. Schools must teach alternatives to evolution in science classes in order to remain neutral with regard to the religious beliefs of the students and their parents. Since many people believe that God created the world in its present form and that human beings did not come about through evolution, teaching evolution in the public schools is not neutral from the perspective of those religious believers. Sometimes this argument is phrased in constitutional terms, Schools that only teach evolution violate the First Amendment. And sometimes it's put forward just as a policy argument. Good, say, or fair education requires schools to teach all sides of the evolution issue. Either way, though, uh, the argument, uh, as we say in the academy, fails to cut the mustard. Now, government neutrality towards religion sounds like a good goal. Why should the government intentionally take a position that's harmful or offensive to religious belief or practice? Why should a public school be able to send a message that is at odds with someone's sincere religious beliefs? All things being equal, of course, it shouldn't. But if you look a little closer, it becomes obvious, I think, that it is impossible for the government, including the public schools, to be truly neutral toward religion. And the key to understanding this point is to recognize both, of the, both the numerous ways that government takes positions in public life and the countless viewpoints embraced by the myriad religious groups and individuals that populate the country. The government affirms specific positions in all sorts of ways in its everyday operations. Through everything from the speeches of public officials, to the funding of certain groups and viewpoints, to the monuments that it puts up on public property, to the criminal laws it passes, to the curricula adopted by public schools. Because the country is so religiously diverse, these government positions inevitably conflict with someone's religious viewpoint. For example, some, and I'm, here I'm just going to keep saying some to signal that I, I'm not saying that everybody who's a member of this group thinks these things, but some Quakers are pacifists. Some Christian scientists do not believe in conventional medicine. Some religious people believe in polygamy. Others preach violence against blacks and Jews. Some people believe that the Bible shows that the earth is flat. The Church of Satan believes in indulgence, vengeance, and engaging in sins for purposes of gratification. Raelians believe that aliens created the human race thousands of years ago. Some practitioners of voodoo believe that dead people can be revived after being buried. Some Wiccans believe they can communicate with the dead through seances. Some Jains believe it is wrong to kill any living thing at all, including bugs and vegetables. And some adherents of Falun Gong believe they can harness their life force to cure illnesses, see into other worlds, move objects by telekinesis, walk through walls, and fly. Now, does anyone really think that the government, in the actions it takes and the messages it sends, must be neutral with regard to all of these religious beliefs? Of course not. The state can take the position that racial intolerance and violence is wrong, that eating vegetables is not a sin, 
that the world is round, that people ought not to be vengeful, that war is sometimes justified, that it is wrong to marry more than one person, that conventional medicine works, and that it is impossible to walk through walls and fly no matter how well one manages his or her life force. The government can punish hate crimes, run public service ads urging citizens to eat their vegetables with that little pyramid thing, employ navigation systems that assume a spherical earth, preach kindness and tolerance towards others, engage in war, make polygamy illegal, fund conventional medicine, and teach in its public schools that people cannot fly. So the, although it might seem like a nice idea for the government to try to be neutral toward religion, it is impossible. It's certainly not required by the First Amendment. Teaching evolution may not be neutral from the perspective of those who do not believe in it, but that does not mean anything for what the schools should teach about it. The argument that the public school curriculum should be viewpoint neutral with regard to religion is totally unworkable. It ignores the fact that there are many religions rather than one and misapprehends the nature of public schooling, which takes all sorts of positions on all types of important issues in almost everything that it does. If the argument were true, schools would have to teach racial hatred, flat earth theory, and flying in addition to ID to make sure they were not being non-neutral with respect to people who happen to believe in these things. And they would also have to teach, I think, that the universe was created by a turtle, a raven, and a spider woman, because some people believe those things as well. And then there are the people who believe that the Holocaust didn't happen. Some people surely hold that view as part of their religious beliefs. Does that mean that public schools should have to teach alternatives to the theory that the Holocaust actually occurred? Now here's the second misconception. This is the one you hear a lot from those who support teaching evolution. It goes like this. Ever since Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, millions and millions of religious people have been able to reconcile their religious beliefs with evolution by believing that God, in fact, guides evolution. Even those who believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority have been able to reconcile the biblical account of creation with evolutionary theory by, for example, interpreting each day of God's creation in Genesis with an era or epoch of evolutionary history. I mean, they say even the Pope believes in evolution, right? And so the argument goes, if it's possible for religious people to reconcile religion and evolution, then there's no problem teaching evolution, right? Schools can teach evolution and not worry about how religious people feel about it because those people can always, if they want, decide that religion and evolution are compatible. This argument, though, has a number of problems. Uh, for one thing, it's completely wrong. Uh, sure, it's theoretically possible for those who believe in a literal reading of the Bible to abandon the view that, in fact, six days means six actual 24-hour periods and that, therefore, evolution is completely incompatible uh, with their religious uh, beliefs. But that doesn't mean they're going to do it or that they should do it or that anyone has the right to ask them to do it. I mean, there are lots of things that are possible. Scientists might decide not to use the scientific method. Uh, my son might decide to suddenly start eating bluefish willy-nilly. I might decide to open a zoo with only black and white animals in it, like with penguins and zebras and panda bears. That doesn't mean any of those things are going to happen, right? The fact is that for a lot, lot, lot of people believe things because of their religion that are simply incompatible with evolution. And if we really want to, those of us who believe in evolution can say, well, too bad for you. But we cannot, in good faith, say that teaching evolution doesn't hurt anybody because creationists could simply change their views. That's the mistake. And this, then, brings me to my visit to Petersburg, Kentucky, and to the 65,000-square-foot Creation Museum, where, as the promotional materials put it, the Bible comes to life. Now, in the fall of 2007, I did a bunch of research for this book I've written, uh, available for pre-order from Amazon.com. Uh, it's called Holy Hullabaloos, as uh, uh, Professor Taylor explained. I won't say it again. Uh, the book is basically an account of what happens when a raw, law and religion professor gets out of his stuffy office, you know, and visits, uh, gets in his 1997 Honda Civic or whatever I have, and, and I go and visit the places where big church state cases came from and talk to people involved in those cases. So I went to a high school football game in East Texas where the crowd used to pray before kickoff. I visited Amish farmers and Santa Rhea priests. I talked to the uh, homeless guy who sued to have the Ten Commandments monument on the Texas Capitol taken down. I talked to the chaplain of the U.S. Senate who was very intimidating and scared me. Uh, it was really fun. Uh, 
And I have a chapter on the evolution controversy in my book. And when I was thinking about where to go on my road trip for that chapter, I had a, obviously a lot of places to choose from. I could have gone to Dayton, Tennessee, of course, where the Scopes trial took place. But I figured, you know, come on. Every law and religion professor and his grandma has been to Dayton, Tennessee. I wanted to do something different. And I wasn't really sure what to do, but then I came across this news story about how some young earth creationists in the Cincinnati area had spent $27 million to build a museum that was outfitted with animatronic dinosaurs and biblical characters. And as uh, myself, uh, an atheist with a kind of a, a sense of humor, I had to go see it. Now, I pulled into the parking lot of the museum about noon on an unseasonably warm October day. I expected perhaps a smattering of cars and people why anyone who is not writing a book about his or her church-state road trip would want to spend such a beautiful day as day indoors, I figured. Uh, I had no idea. Wrong. The parking lot was packed. Uh, packed, uh, as I like to say, like Paul Brown Stadium when the Steelers are in town. I had to park like, I mean, I had to park like on someone's uh, yard, someone's front yard. Um, it was amazing. And it took, uh, took me a half an hour to get a ticket. And then it took me another half an hour waiting in line to get into the main exhibit of the museum. Luckily, I, was, I entertained myself by watching a couple of these huge animatronic dinosaurs that wouldn't have been out of place in a theme park. And in fact, some of the exhibits were actually created by the person who made the Jaws exhibit at Universal. One of the dinosaurs was there happily munching some leaves and wagging its tail, and I smiled. And what a cute dinosaur, I thought. But wait, I wondered, what was that next to the dinosaur? Could it be? Yes, it was a person. A person was standing next to the dinosaur, and the person was holding a carrot and smiling and nodding her head, going like this. Uh, it looked like she was going to feed the carrot to an animatronic squirrel. I was mesmerized. I have to give this place credit. As a monument to biblical literalism, the museum is unbelievably fascinating, and it's extremely well done. Uh, myself, I usually find museums to be very boring, actually, but I never lost interest in this one. The designers successfully integrated all sorts of stuff from still photography to video to animatronics to a kind of like Disney set design to convey their message in an incredibly effective and entertaining fashion. Now, I personally don't believe the message, but I have to hand it to the people who made the museum for doing an extraordinary job at what they set out to do. When you're in the main exhibit, you follow the people ahead of you through a series of rooms that you walk through in order. From the very beginning, the museum makes clear what it thinks about evolution and the Bible. A display you walk by on the way in says that according to the fossil records, a massive flood 4,350 years ago caused the death and burial of massive piles of animals and plants. This, of course, was Noah's flood. And the first two stops, once you're inside the actual exhibit, build on the theme, pointing out that since, quote, fossils don't come with tags on them, unquote, it's possible for different scientists with different starting points to come to different conclusions about how old they are. Whether you believe in human reason or instead believe in God's word will determine whether you think the fossils were caused by one massive flood that occurred 4,350 years ago or not. Now, in case you're wondering why we ought to believe in God's word over human reason, the next exhibit offers a few reasons. Because it offers hope for one thing and because it's true. The museum cites various scrolls and archaeological discoveries. Uh, the signs explain that hundreds of biblical prophecies have been fulfilled. One sign announces linguists, paleontologists, and geologists confirm the biblical truth. And for the record, I would also like to note that there are signs throughout the museum that say, thou shalt not touch, which I think are pretty funny. Uh, now, after a little movie about how the Supreme Court has kicked the Ten Commandments out of the public square, which is not actually true, and forced prayer out of the schools, which is also not true, I think, things start getting very cool. There's the so-called graffiti corridor, where visitors are forced to kind of smoosh together and inch their way through this dark, reddish, narrow hallway with scary lighting that's meant to resemble an abandoned area of an inner city, complete with this little rat that's sitting up, kind of looking at you like it's going to jump. The exhibit actually reminded me a lot of the sort of dicey uh, uh, alleyway in the back of the Boston building where I live, only it had fewer prostitutes. Um, on the walls are posted all sorts of newspaper headlines and magazine articles and the like that proclaim all of the terrible things that are happening in the modern world, like pornography and school shootings and mothers killing their babies in microwave ovens and that sort of thing. Signs make it clear that all of these things have occurred because our culture has abandoned scripture. And then there's my favorite part of the museum, uh, which is called Culture in Crisis. 
and it consists of various televisions inset into the walls, which are playing short movies depicting some relatively minor thing that has gone wrong because we have disregarded the Bible. So in one movie, a teenage girl sits on a round chair talking on the phone to a friend about how she thinks she's pregnant. In the next, there's a boy who's wearing a shirt that says uh, frowny face plus beer equals smiley face. You know, except it doesn't say frowny face, it's an actual frowny face, but I can't do that. Uh, and, uh, and, this guy, and this kid is rolling a joint. And then there's the third movie, uh, was show, showing the slob of a guy sitting on a couch drinking beer and watching football, and his, in the foreground his wife is gossiping with some a friend of theirs. And I, I'm not sure how they got into my apartment to film that one, but it was kind of uh, interesting to see. Now, after that, uh, beginning with an kind of uncharacteristically for the museum boring four-minute movie called uh, in the uh, sorry not called but in the six days of creation theater, the rest of the main exhibit takes visitors through the so-called seven C's of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. And this is where the animatronics start kicking in. There's an animatronic Noah who gives a speech about his ark. Uh, and then there's Noah's grandfather who apparently lived to 969 years old. And he gives a talk about his favorite grandson, uh, his, his famous grandson. Um, now, look, I, I know that my description of the Creation Museum here is uh, snarky. I, and I apologize for that. I do, actually. There's plenty of snarky things one might say about my own lack of beliefs, my own atheism, not least of which is that it can be incredibly depressing, which it is to me. My point in going to the museum and describing it here is to underline a very, what I think is an obvious point, but that somehow, somehow is glanced over by evolution supporters. Uh, it's the point that many people, some of you are probably here today, do not believe in evolution. Now, if you're someone like me, you know, or you're someone like my students that I had in France when I taught in France, um, this seems impossible to believe. But the fact is, it's true, right? How else could someone get $27 million together to build a museum devoted to the point? Maybe a million people, I don't know, have visited the museum. And... I'm the only one who went there because I thought it was kind of weird, right? So the real question then is how those of us who believe in evolution should deal with the fact that so many people do not. One possibility, of course, would be to simply say that since half the country believes in creationism of some sort, we should let those beliefs have, have as much influence on our public policy, like funding for scientific research, as evolution does. I would guess that close to zero evolutionists would take that position, and I don't myself. Alternatively, we could dismiss these millions of people, uh, you know, as people who have no claim whatsoever on our attention. We could, like some of those pro-evolution people writing to the Orlando newspaper, reject those who reject evolution as, quote, nutcases or, quote, zombies, and then do whatever we want without any regard to how this massive part of our national population feels about it. And I think that's a terrible idea. I don't think that dismissing a massive population, a uh, portion of our national population, uh, is a healthy way to act in a democracy. So instead, what I think we ought to do, and I'm speaking here, of course, as an unapologetic evolutionist and an atheist, is we can work hard from stopping, to stop creationism from influencing our public policy regarding science, but ultimately recognize that those who reject evolution are citizens who are entitled to our respect, even if we disagree fundamentally with what they believe. And if there is anything we can do within the realm of public policy that can signal this respect without causing tangible harm, we should do that too, if for no other reason than it might go some way toward conciliation. And that's why I have partially, uh, that's partially why I have argued for a long time that public schools should teach students more about religion. For a variety of reasons, schools teach very little about religion. They rarely offer comparative religion as a separate subject. They often don't talk about religion in history class or English class or current events class or anywhere else that religion in, uh, would seem to be a self-evidently important thing to talk about. Now, part of the reason for this is that schools misunderstand the Supreme Court's holdings on religion. While schools can't teach that religion is true, they can, in fact, the Supreme Court has said they should teach about religion. And also, of course, schools reasonably fear being sued by those who want schools to be completely religion-free. 
It's also the case that not many teachers have been trained to teach about religion and that materials for teaching about religion have not been that great either. But whatever the reason, one of the effects of excluding religion from the curriculum is that it sends a message to religious believers that the state thinks religion is completely unimportant. So it's no wonder that so many deeply religious people hate public education, push for school voucher programs, and move money away from the desperately needy public schools into private religious education. Now, the case for teaching about religion goes beyond this concern, and in fact is fully justified by completely secular reasons. Whether you are religious or not, or whether, regardless of what religion you might believe in, you have to concede, I think, that over the course of history, religion has played an unbelievably important role in every aspect of human affairs, from art to literature to politics to economics to science and beyond. Moreover, religion is probably as important today as it has ever been. From terrorism to bioethics to the Da Vinci Code, religion plays a central role in our current world. How can we say we are educating our children if we teach them nothing about religion? How can we expect our graduates to participate intelligently and effectively in our democratic system if they don't understand anything about one of the most important characteristics of the human race? Now, of course, I fully realize that teaching about religion will not be easy, uncomplicated, or a panacea. For one thing, the line between teaching objectively about religion on the one hand and promoting religion or proselytizing for it on the other can get pretty fuzzy, particularly in the messy context of the school curriculum or school classroom. And it's also been the case that some groups have tried to use the teaching about religion label to smuggle in promotion of religion. And of course, many deeply religious people will, who dis dislike the public schools will not be satisfied by this arguably relatively minor reform for a variety of reasons, including objecting to the very notion that religion can even be talked about objectively at all. Still, though, I'm confident that teaching about religion more in the schools would do far more good than harm, and I think that's why an increasing number of people in recent years have started embracing the idea. One person who has embraced the idea that schools should teach about religion is my colleague, Steve Prothero, who's the chair of the religion department at Boston University. A couple of years ago, he wrote a book called Religious Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know and Doesn't, in which he pointed out that although the United States is maybe the most religious country in the world, most Americans know very little at all about religion. Prothero finds this ironic, but he also thinks it's dangerous because so many of our public disputes center around religion. As examples of how religious illiteracy can lead to disaster, he cites an incident involving the murder of a Sikh who was mistaken for a Muslim because of his turban in the wake of 9-11, as well as to the Branch Davidian debacle in Waco, which he suggests was exacerbated by religious ignorance. Had authorities understood David Koresh's end times theology, Prothero argues things might have turned out differently. As part of the solution to this uh, dangerous religious intolerance, Prothero argues that schools should tar start teaching students more about religion. And specifically, he says that schools should teach at least one course in world religions and one in the Bible. Uh, Prothero uh, wrote his book for a popular audience, and he stuck in a lot of clever stuff to appeal to readers. The book has a religious literacy quiz so that readers can see how much they know about religion. It has an 85-page dictionary of religious uh, literacy in case somebody needs to brush up on their Taoism. And finally, it relates to some sadly hilarious anecdotes about how Americans are real dolts when it comes to religion. Lots of high school seniors in the United States think that Sodom and Gomorrah were married. 10% um, of Americans think that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Only uh, one third of those asked could identify Jesus as the source of the Sermon on the Mount, and so on and so on. And it was partially all this neat stuff that got Prothero an incredible amount of media attention for this important message. He was on the front cover of Newsweek. He got invited onto The Daily Show and Oprah. Now, I've also written about religious literacy, although admittedly in a law review article read by maybe 17 law professors rather than a best-selling book. I wait every day for my call from Oprah, but it never, ever comes. And while, now, while Prothero and I, we have similar uh, views, we differ on a few details. For example, as Prothero explains in his book, he disagrees with my argument that promoting tolerance should be part of the justification for teaching about religion. In his view, improving knowledge rather than tolerance is the only justification we need for teaching about religion. I agree with him 
that promoting knowledge is a sufficient justification for schools to start teaching more about religion. But I also suspect, as at least one recent study from uh, Modesto, California has demonstrated, that when people learn more about other religions, they are more likely to respect those who are different. Um, I think that definitely happened to me when I did, a, uh, I did a master's degree in religious studies at the University of Chicago Divinity School and studied Christian theological ethics for the first time. And I can testify that this is, was true for me. And I think it would be true for others. I also think that teaching about religion will go a long way toward making a lot of deeply religious people feel more comfortable with public education. And so in my view, these are important justifications for making a significant change in educational policy. Now, I'm also not so sure about Prothero's emphasis on how people need to know specific facts, you know, names, doctrines about religion, as opposed to learning general themes and characteristics of religious beliefs and practices. I think the literacy dictionary and the literacy test and the anecdotes about how Americans don't know about religion are shrewd hooks for getting people to think about the teaching about religion problem, but I don't think the real issue with religious literacy is that people don't know specifics. I mean, after all, are adults really supposed to remember all the stuff they learned in school? I was sitting in my hotel room this morning, and I was trying to recall the different stages of meiosis, uh, which I know that I learned in Brother Tim Paul's class. I went to Catholic high school back in the ninth grade, although uh, for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. But failure to remember specifics does not, I hope, mean that one's education was flawed, what we take from our schooling is an appreciation of what is important and a basic understanding of various bodies of knowledge that will help us navigate the world once we graduate rather than specific facts and pieces of knowledge. So even though I don't know any of the 72 stages of meiosis, uh, I do understand the scientific method. And I bet that Brother Tim Paul, uh, if he were happened to be a slighter, nicer guy that he was, would be satisfied that at least I remember that. The fact is that facts can be looked up if you know that it's important to look for them. It's the deeper knowledge that's critical. So I'm not convinced by Prothero's example of Waco and the murdered Sikh. Neither of these situations, it seems to me, would have come out any differently if schools had just focused on teaching religious specifics. The problem in Waco was not that the FBI personnel running the siege operation didn't know the specifics of end times theology, but rather that they didn't appreciate that a religious leader might have such a completely different perception of events that they should have sought expert advice from someone who did know those specifics. And I doubt very much that the murdered Sikh uh, would still be alive if the post-September 11 killer had learned in high school that Sikhs too wear turbans. Perhaps nothing could have stopped this uh, senseless murder, but if anything taught in school could have, maybe it would have been a lesson that conveyed something about how different adherence to the same general religious faith can hold very different views on political issues, or maybe a lesson that stressed religious tolerance and understanding. And that's why I think that schools should focus on teaching more or less general characteristics of religion, including its crucial role in guiding human behavior and central place in the ordering of societies, rather than focusing on facts and specifics like who gave the Sermon on the Mount. Still, though, I agree with Prothero that it would be nice if more people knew a few more facts about religion. Maybe if our schools stop worried less about critiquing Darwinism and worried less about intelligent design, less about creation science, and they focused more on teaching students what they need to know to live in a world permeated by religion, a world that one cannot even begin to understand without knowing something about religion, then a few more students would, in fact, realize that Sodom and Gomorrah were not husband and wife. And then maybe we could come a tiny bit closer to achieving civic peace on the question of the incredibly important question, uh, prop, uh, the, on the import, incredibly important question of the proper place of religion in the public schools which continues to be one of our most enduring and difficult public controversies. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming and listening. Uh, it's been a delight speaking with you, and I look forward to a few minutes of questions, I hope. Thank you. Thanks. So, yeah, Professor Webster has agreed to take some questions. Um, if your name is Steve, be forewarned. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to monitor you closely. Uh, so uh, uh, please, questions.
Microphone's coming, John. Hold on just a second. We, we want to get you on tape for posterity. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I, I really appreciate your suggestion, and, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I wondered in the conversation about religion in the schools or in general, whether you could buy into the idea that ev the, that a popular mainstream way of looking at evolution is religious. I, I often hear people speak of evolution as if it has intelligently designed the universe, has given us higher consciousness, has given us opposable thumbs. I'm not arguing against it. I, I, but. But the idea that evolution itself is purposeful and mm -hmm. prud um, providential, can you, can you see that as a religious view? Well, um, I, so I, you know, I think for constitution, so I'll answer quickly about the legal issue and then talk about the more important thing, I think. You know, as a legal issue, I don't think anybody uh, in the current state of the teaching of evolution can, is going to win an argument that evolution is a religion. Um, but I so so I don't think there's any argument that schools uh, can't teach evolution on the basis that evolu that it would be an establishment of religion to do so. Now I per I, I thought you were going to ask uh, say um, talk about evolution as a religion from sort of the the Richard Dawkins perspective, where like people who who are out there saying evolution you know uh, is right and and it proves that there's no God and so we ought to believe in evolution, sort of like people believe in a religion. Uh, and I agree that sometimes evolution can seem like a religion uh, in that sense. And, and to the extent it does, I think that it is an argument that can be certainly should be taught about, you know, in the uh, in the current affairs class or the philosophy class or, you know, the I, you know if if I had my way, I would teach a comparative origins you know unit within a comparative religions class. And one thing we would talk about is does evolution function as a religion in our society for a lot of people. Um, I don't. I don't know about this uh, argument that evolution, um, you know, is a religion because evolution is purposefully guided, uh, unless you mean the argument that the sort of argument where where evolution and, and um, religion come together, such that people might say evolution is guided by God or something like that, um, which of course is something that some people that a lot of people believe. Um, so I can't really since I haven't heard of that idea that you mentioned I can't I can't really comment on it. I, I want to give you an example. Okay. Uh, it was a, a recent uh, study by two two by scientists at Harvard that said that women's uh, hip bones and uh, certain part of the vertebrae were different. Um, and just in an informal way of speaking of it to a newspaper article, one of the researchers said that it took a lot of tinkering for evolution to bring this about. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I mean, I, I, if there are people, uh, biologists in the, uh, here maybe be better uh, suited to speak to that. I mean, I don't, my understanding is that evolutionists might use the word tinkering and what they mean is, you know, through random mutation and natural selection, we end up with things that look like they have been designed uh, in a sense. But I don't, but I don't know that they would say that, that they have been designed. And if they have, well, that's an interesting uh, question. And, I would talk about that if there was room. I have two, uh, two questions. First, would you comment, if you would, on the importance or lack of Joseph Campbell's work and his comparative, uh, he does a lot of work in comparative religions, if you could comment on that. And the second part of it is what is your view of the manner in which the ACLU addresses issues of religion when they enter the public, uh, the public realm? Uh -huh. Well, I don't know what I can say much about the first. We're talking, this is the myths, the uh, Joseph Campbell's and the myths and the all. Um, uh -huh. I think they should teach his book in the schools. I mean, I think, you know, like I'd love, I would love, I, I, you know, I have a slight bias here, which I, I'm, I'm, an, I, I, I'm an Asian studies, I have an Asian studies background. I, I lived in China. I studied Chinese philosophy and religion. And I would love to see the schools teach about, you know, Taoism and stuff. I don't know if, if they ever would, and I wouldn't say that they have to or anything. But, um, you know, to the extent that he's talking about myths, uh, uh, a comparative myths and comparative uh, sort of history of religions and rituals and things across cultures, I think that would be a, a lovely thing for schools to teach about. The ACLU and religion, um, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure quite what, you, what, what you're asking about. I think the ACLU has a fairly 
reasonable uh, approach to religion in the public square. Uh, and this not, I mean, I, my, I have a good friend who is the head of the religion program at the ACLU, uh, you know, so I'll just admit that to everybody. But, um, uh, you know, I think the ACLU uh, takes positions that are in favor of religious freedom, for one thing. The ACLU will defend uh, people who argue that the government is burdening their religion. And I think that's important to realize, that the ACLU has actually uh, argued in many cases on behalf of religion, religious believers. To the extent that they object to things like the Ten Commandments uh, in the public square, um, or I don't think they're in the uh, Michael Newdow's Under God uh, case, although I'm not sure. I, I agree with that. I, I, I think that the um, that these I, I fully understand that this is never going to happen. That the courts are going to order uh, these sort of what we call ceremonial deism idea, uh, little things like in God we trust or whatever off our money. That's never really going to happen. I would prefer that it did, uh, although I, it's not something I would feel strongly about and want to litigate about. But I think those things. Um, like under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, send me a message from the government to people like me that uh, that my you know belief system is under is not valued, and so I you know I think it's a gr I think that the I, I would prefer a world in which we didn't have those things though it's not the thing I'm going to spend my life you know working on. Hi, thank Hello. you for sharing. I found it really interesting. I also found your title very provoking and that you found that there are two mistakes generally in this argument. And I have another one um, that I hold, um, which is that creation and evolution are often discussed as mutually exclusive ideas, where creation, in my opinion, creation is a discussion of the origins of life. And evolution, I'm a scientist, so I feel comfortable saying, evolution is more a discussion of how life evolves and adapts to its environment, specifically with natural selection. Um, there is another position that you didn't really discuss much that although creation may be an explanation for the origins of life, perhaps evolution also plays a role in how that life, which was created, has after that fact adapted. How do you feel about, um, although the, the two topics are related, how do you feel about that approach to education? Well, um, if I understand correctly, uh, you're saying you know, there are ways, of course, of reconciling creation and evolution, saying that they talk about different things, you know. Um, like as you're saying, so creation is about the origin of the universe. Evolution is about what happens after, right? Uh, and so, so therefore, they're very different, uh, just areas of inquiry. And so, um, no, you didn't go so far as to say, so therefore, we don't need to worry about it, right, which is one of my mistakes, the things I mentioned as a mistake. But I'm not sure what that gets you because... Uh, you know, say there's somebody who says, you know, but evolution, uh, part of Darwinism, is, you know, is, a, is a inherent and is a suggestion that life has evolved over billions of years. And that's just inconsistent with what I believe is the story of creation because I read Genesis and I think, you know, God created the world 4,350 years ago and I don't, I don't think they're different, right? And so, you know, there's this tendency to say, well, you know, but yes, yes, they are. Uh, you know, to somebody who, who, who feels that they are, right? And, you know, so you could say back to that person, well, but isn't creation just about the beginning and then evolution is about what happens after? To which they say, no, not for me. Um, and, you know, so what do you do then? Then you have the real conflict. And that's why we have these conflicts, I think, is because there's a lot, because a lot of people find them to be unreconcilable. And so we don't, I don't think we get very far in saying it's possible if we're different to reconcile them, because we have to face, you know, sh straight on this idea that it's it, the two are incompatible for a lot of people, you know. So, so I guess what I might say is, if I was teaching a class in, um, you know, the philosophy of, I don't know what it, what it would be called, what your view, you know, that view would be one view among others that we would talk about when we were talking about what, you know, the relationship between evolution and creation and the disputes and controversies that surround the. It was something that we talk about. But I don't think it gets us out of the problem that we have. I don't know if that, you can talk later about it. Professor, from a public policy perspective, to what extent do you agree with the notion that much of the controversy surrounding religion and science is based just as much on a global societal unawareness of factual science 
as upon any deeply held views as they pertain to religion. Um, yeah, that's a hard, I mean, it, it's, so the extension of that is, you know, if we just had more science, uh, people would start ha changing their religious beliefs, right? I mean, I mean it's, a, it's not that they're, the pro you know, the problem, and I'm just going to put that in quotes because, you know, it, it's a problem in some senses, it's not a problem in other senses, but um, so it's not that people are really, really religious, it's that they just don't, they're not scientifically literate, and if they, if we had this, you know, a, a serious global push to teach people more science, then more people would realize, oh, you know, there are all these scientific arguments in, in, in favor of Darwinism, and therefore, and therefore what? Um, you know, s start believing that Darwin isn't true and, re and abandon their religious beliefs? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's sort of an issue that I don't even know if I want to comment on it exactly, because it's sort of like saying, you know, we ought to teach more and more about science so that people lose their religion, you know, which I don't feel comfortable with. I mean, I think we should teach more and more and more about science, and whatever happens, happens. People will know more about science, and that's good, and that can be enough to justify teaching about science. Um, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to go farther than that. So from a public policy perspective, I would say teach science, teach science, but not because we want to uh, solve this problem of religion and science having a conflict. Um, professor, I just had a question just from almost like an anti-litigation um, mm -hmm. perspective, if one could even frame it as that. Um, Obviously, like, well, I you know think that your idea is great, and I am one, I have read your law review article, so I don't think that it's only seven. <laughs> one of the seventeen, thank you. There. They are brilliant. <laughs> um, but um, I was just like, as far as like as applied challenges go, like I mean, there are examples where like moment of silence laws have gone dreadfully wrong, where somehow in certain situations, like the teachers left the room, and like you know the you know the minority religious child for not like putting his head down and praying is now like ostracized in school. Yeah. Um, and also for schools that are trying to implement this, you know, again, to just kind of promote tolerance and just knowledge in general, like what would be the best route to prevent litigation if that's at all possible? Yeah, it's an enormous problem. I mean, the, I mean when, I t when I usually, uh, <laughs> that's, that's funny, when I, I'll just tell a little anecdote. When I, 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 I had this, I, this article that, uh, about that schools should teach about religion. It was the article I used to try to get a job teaching. Uh, at law schools, <laughs> um, and I, I was afraid that everybody's going to look at this and say, "Oh, this is so obvious. Uh, what a, what a, you know, not a good article because it's so obvious." And it turned out that the problem with it was that it was so controversial uh, that you know everybody I talked to thought, "Oh, you can't do that. No way." And so it was the opposite of what I thought. And and Mason, and, and of course, lawyers were trained to to see all the 500 problems right immediately, which is good, I guess, uh, if you're a lawyer. But um, Yes, there are lots and lots of specific problems that can crop up. Uh, you know, you mentioned a couple. There are others. Um, you know, what do you do if you? This is my favorite example. Uh, if there's, if there are disputed, um, you know, con uh, if there's a controversy within, say, uh, a particular religious tradition, uh, which which one do you teach as being normative? Uh, there was a big dispute in California being, uh, among uh, Hindu communities. Uh, about how Hinduism was being taught about in the in the in the in their in the textbooks, and you know some of these things can lead to litigation. Uh, lots of them can. So what do you do? Um, there are groups out there. Um, there's this guy called named Charles Haynes. He works at Vanderbilt in the Freedom Forum, and he has a group. Uh, he has materials. He has teachers that he works with. He has DVDs, uh, and what he does is he works with school. Districts. He works very closely with them to try to help them understand, uh, you know, the difficulties and how they have to go about doing it, teaching religion without raise, uh, tr trying to limit litigation possibilities, and uh, trying to kind of work with the community so that everybody kind of has a stake in what's happening. So, uh, you know, it's not nobody feels like it's forced upon them. Um, and and these these tactics uh, apparently have had some success in the communities that this, that Charles has worked in, in resulting in a teaching about religious religion program that has not led to litigation. So there are things we can do. We can come up with materials. We can train teachers. We can go into communities and provide them help. Um, you know, is it going to make it litigation free? You know, take away all chance of litigation? Of course, of course not. And so the question is, is it worth it? Right. 
And a lot of people will say, no, uh, you know, do we want a lot of litigation when all we're going to have is just a little bit of understanding about religion? And then you just, all you can do is say, well, I think that if you graduate, it's worse to graduate students uh, who don't know anything about religion than it is to possibly have, you know, a court case here and there. I think we've got, got time for one more, I think. Professor, this morning on the radio, uh -huh. you said that uh, you were in favor of allowing creationist children to opt out of evolution classes in science. Now, how do you justify that? To me, that makes no sense at all, especially in a state like West Virginia where we have so many creationist parents and so many children who have low educational scores. Well, um, sh sure. Uh, you know, there's a cost to letting people uh, opt out, and I, uh, you know, if I if I lived in West Virginia, maybe I would, I would, you know, just facing what you're saying instead of Boston, you know, would I think differently about it? Um, you know, I feel very strongly though that uh, people should not be burdened by government to do things that are contrary to their religious beliefs, unless the government has a very, very very good reason, um, and can do so in a very you know targeted uh, way. And this sort of well, it's, so I so I think that I'm worried about religious people being burdened by government, uh, and in all sorts of ways. And one of them is I think that if uh, you're here we're talking about parents. There's a parent sends their child to school, and they think that teaching evolution is a completely uh, violates the child's religious uh, beliefs and the parent's religious beliefs. Um, you know, I don't think the government should insist on something that would burden their religious beliefs in that way. That's just my own view. The Supreme Court thinks differently. So, uh, you know, there are cases there, and there are many cases uh, about this. There was one case from Tennessee, a famous uh, case where. There was a school program which taught all sorts of things. It was a reading uh, class, and they taught tolerance, and they taught uh, equal equality of the, of the sexes and all sorts of things. And there was a parent who didn't want her student to read this, uh, take part in this class, uh, and she sued, and, uh, and she lost. Uh, and that's you know, basically the view of the courts, is that if the school wants you to take something, you, then you have to take it. I worry a little bit about, about those students and those, and those parents. But I understand it's a hard, hard question. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. If you'd join me to thank Professor Wexler again. Thank you. And then we have a, if you could, if you could stay for just a moment, we have a few words from Ann Lafazzo. I will be very brief. We do have a reception following, so I, I will be very, very brief. Um, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in this. Um, I, I'm sure I will forget people because I didn't write a list, but Margaret O'Booch and, and Brian Caudill and, and all the faculty and Stan Cohen and all the people at the university, many of whom have been working anonymously. So just really thanking everyone. Um, I also hope that you enjoyed the talk today. I think it was very provocative for both um, for people at all different sides of the debate. There's not just creationists and evolutionists, but many, there's many different sides. I know I found it uh, thought provoking. Um, I also want to say my high school actually on Long Island did teach world culture and religion. And uh, in 12th grade, uh, the Bible as literature. So we did, um, and we seem to be, also had a lot of religious controversy being a very ethnically diverse area like, like New York is. But um, just as, an, as a token of our um, appreciation for you coming, we were going to give you an autographed copy of my article on intelligent design. <laughs> but given that I argued that intelligent design is not science, we thought that might upset you. So we decided instead to give you something more about West Virginia. And um, I think I told you that West Virginia is known for its excellent glasswork yeah. at lunch. So we do have a little, little gift for you. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> You're all welcome to go to the reception and to talk to Professor Wexler during the reception.